it's hard to imagine just how small cells are. The largest cells are still smaller than a grain of salt. But the biological macromolecules that create cells are even smaller. There are four categories of biological macromolecules, nucleic acids, proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids. To understand just how small they are, we have to zoom all the way in, all the way to the scale of single nanometers, which is much smaller than the smallest virus. These macromolecules are what make life on Earth possible. Plus, they will be on the AP test. So, stick with us as we cover everything you need to know about biological macromolecules. This video covers section 1.4 of the AP Biology curriculum, Properties of Biological Macromolecules. In this video, we will start with the properties of nucleic acids, including how they create DNA and RNA, and how they store information. Then, we'll see how the information from nucleic acids is used to make proteins, and how proteins make cells function. After the quiz, we'll cover both simple and complex carbohydrates and their uses within cells. Finally, we'll take a look at the several different kinds of lipids. This video is meant to be a quick overview to help you better understand the topics and prepare for the AP test. If you only need to review one of these topics, feel free to skip forward to the times outlined here. Let's get started. Let's start with arguably the most important biological macromolecule, nucleic acids. To fully understand how nucleic acids work, we need to look at their structure. First, let's take a look at the sugar phosphate backbone of a nucleic acid. At the center of every nucleic acid is the sugar phosphate backbone. Each phosphate group from one nucleotide monomer bonds to the sugar group on the next monomer to create a rigid structure known as the backbone of DNA. No matter how long this sugar phosphate backbone gets, there will always be a phosphate group exposed on one end and a sugar molecule exposed on the other. Therefore, we call both a single nucleotide and many nucleotides connected together a nucleic acid. The main difference between DNA and RNA lies in the sugar molecule that is used. DNA uses deoxyribose, seen here. RNA uses ribose, the same sugar with one extra oxygen atom. This tiny difference creates some of the functional differences between DNA and RNA within cells that will be covered more in section 1.6. The part of a nucleotide that is most important to carrying information is the nucleotide base. The base seen here is cytosine though it is just one of five different nucleotide bases that can be used. Let's see exactly how these different nitrogenous bases work. There are five nitrogenous bases used in nature to create DNA and RNA. These nitrogenous bases are separated into two groups based on their structure. The purines are based on a double ring structure, whereas the pyrimidines are based on a single ring structure. Adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine are used to create DNA molecules. Uracil is used in RNA in place of thymine, partly because RNA is a single-stranded molecule. We'll go more into this difference in our video on nucleic acids in section 1.6. More importantly, the nitrogenous bases create the double helix structure of DNA through their ability to form hydrogen bonds. This is what holds the two strands together. Let's take a closer look. Each purine has a corresponding pyrimidine that it can form hydrogen bonds with. You can remember which nitrogenous bases can form hydrogen bonds using a simple mnemonic device. The tall letters, A and T, can form hydrogen bonds, and the fat letters, C and G, can form hydrogen bonds. Each complementary base pair has the exact opposite electrical charges compared to its complement. Therefore, there, these are the only combinations that can form hydrogen bonds easily. This will be very important to remember when we start to learn how DNA is synthesized and how errors in the DNA code are corrected. DNA stores information through a slightly complex mechanism. DNA is stored in the nucleus as a double helix. 
This allows it to stay protected from damage. However, only one of these strands, the sense strand, actually carries the information needed to create proteins. The other strand, the antisense strand, contains complementary nucleotides to the sense strand. RNA contains the same nucleotides as the sense strand because it is created by matching to the antisense strand. RNA molecules can carry the information to where it is needed, like a messenger. This messenger RNA molecule carries the nucleotide sequence out of the nucleus, where a ribosome can attach to it. The ribosome then creates a new protein molecule by matching transfer RNA molecules to every three nucleotide sequence, known as a codon. This process, called translation, is how the information in DNA becomes an actual cellular product and allows the cells to function. Think about this. All organisms on Earth use the exact same method of turning DNA information into proteins in order to create their bodies. For example, both this snail and this soybean are actively transcribing RNA from the DNA code and translating that RNA into proteins. In turn, these proteins give their cells different functions. These cells create tissues, which in turn create organs, allowing these organisms to grow and reproduce. This is the so-called central dogma of biology. DNA creates RNA, RNA creates proteins, and proteins create function. Now that we know how DNA stores the information to build proteins, let's take a look at proteins themselves. Proteins are simply large strings of amino acids that fold into specific shapes. Each protein serves a different function made possible by its three-dimensional shape and the amino acids it is made of. Amino acids, also called peptides, are bonded together by peptide bonds. These bonds form through a dehydration reaction between a carboxyl group and an amino group on each amino acid. On one side of a protein string is the carboxyl terminus, while on the other side of the molecule is the amino terminus. Make sure you understand the difference between these two sections, because questions on the AP test can reference these different sides. There are 20 common amino acids that are used to make the billions of proteins found in nature. The structures that make each amino acid different are known as R groups or side chains. These groups are what give each amino acid its unique functionality. Each R group has a different chemical composition which allows each amino acid to serve a different chemical and physical role within the structure of a protein. Though there are 20 plus amino acids used in nature, we can classify these amino acids into seven different functional groups based on their chemical and physical properties. For instance, several amino acids have positively charged R groups. This helps create a hydrophilic portion of the peptide that can easily interact with water and is attracted to negatively charged amino acids. Other amino acids contain sulfur, which is able to form sulfur crosslinks with other sulfur-containing peptides. This can help hold multiple polypeptides together in a larger quaternary structure. To see why R groups are so important, let's look at the structure of an actual protein. First, look at the active site. This is where the protein will carry out its function. The amino acids used within the active site must have the right physical and chemical properties to hold onto a substrate and catalyze a reaction. Likewise, this protein also must have some hydrophobic regions where it needs to bind to the cell membrane. If hydrophilic amino acids were used in place of hydrophobic amino acids, this protein could not stick within the cell membrane and would not be functional. Proteins serve many different roles in cells, which require different shapes and chemical properties. So, the protein must have the right sequence of amino acids in order to fold into the proper shape and function correctly. Pop quiz time! Now that we have studied some of the properties of nucleic acids and proteins, pause the video and answer these questions. Hopefully you weren't napping! You can find the answers to these questions through the quick test prep link in this video's description.
Carbohydrates most commonly serve roles as fuel and building materials for a cell. The simplest carbohydrates, called monosaccharides, are hydrocarbon rings of five or six carbons that often have a ring-like structure. Glucose, for instance, serves as the main fuel molecule for cells. Carbohydrates made with two monosaccharides are called disaccharides. Some organisms store disaccharides instead of monosaccharides for the sake of efficiency. However, as you connect more and more carbohydrate monomers, you can create very different substances with many different properties. The exact structure of a large polysaccharide helps determine its function. Linear po polymers are most often found in structural molecules like cellulose. These fibers, much like the smaller threads in a large rope, can intertwine and form hydrogen bonds to create a much stronger material. Some structural carbohydrates even have covalently bonded crosslinks between the fibers, adding another layer of strength to the overall molecule. By contrast, storage polysaccharides most often have a branch structure. Unlike a linear structure, this allows a cell to store as much energy as possible in a small space. Starch molecules, such as amylose found in potatoes, are branched polysaccharides that store massive amounts of energy. Most complex network shapes can form mesh-like structures that hold extracellular components in place and allow cells to form tissues. These are just some of the many, many ways that carbohydrates are used within cells. Whew, you're doing great, and we're almost finished. If you need to take a short break, now's a good time. We have one more short topic to cover and one more quiz, and then we're done with this section. Keep moving forward, and eventually we'll get out together. The last category of macromolecules that we will look at is lipids. There are three types of lipids that are most important to life, fats, phospholipids, and steroids. Some people consider waxes their own category, though they have a structure that is very similar to triglycerides. Let's take a look at each of these groups. Triglycerides are simply fatty acid molecules bound into a larger molecule with glycerol, a three carbon alcohol. Fatty acids come in two forms, saturated and unsaturated. Palmitic acid is an example of a saturated fatty acid. Every carbon in the chain is bound to at least two hydrogens, leaving no room for double bonds between carbon atoms. Structurally, this makes saturated fats very linear. Therefore, you can pack many saturated fatty acids into a very tight space. Because of this structure, saturated fatty acids are usually solid at room temperature because the molecules squeeze tightly together and lose thermal energy. By contrast, an unsaturated fatty acid like linoleic acid has double bonds between carbons in the chain. Double bonds are rigid and create a crooked tail that takes up way more space. This means that unsaturated fatty acids push each other apart and remain a liquid, even at room temperature. Olive oil is a good example of an unsaturated fatty acid. Phospholipids are structurally different compared to the triglycerides, and they also serve a much different purpose within organisms. Phospholipids have a hydrophilic head connected to a hydrophobic tail. These, like triglycerides, phospholipid tails can use saturated or unsaturated fatty acids. Different organisms use different combinations of phospholipid tails to keep their cell membranes fluid and permeable at the temperature they have adapted to live in. When many phospholipids congregate together, the head groups interact with water while the tail groups tend to orient towards each other. This is how the lipid bilayer of all cells is created. We will take a much closer look at phospholipids in section 2.4 when we focus on the plasma membrane. Let's see if you understand the basics of proteins, carbohydrates, and lipid structures. You can now pause the video again and answer this second set of questions. Be sure to follow the link in this video's description to the quick test prep for this section, where you can find all the answers and make sure that you understand the topics. We also have a number of other resources available that will help you study for the AP test. Thanks for watching, 
If you enjoyed this video and found it helpful, please like this video, leave us any comments or questions you have about biological macromolecules, and subscribe to the Biology Dictionary channel to easily find all of our AP Biology videos and resources. Good luck!